This week I want to talk about something that's a little removed from open education itself. The way open education builds upon the work being done in other open movements. Open education is a term that's been used for decades, often referring to teaching practices that encourage student participation and the use of innovative techniques in the classroom. However, open education as we see it today didn't become popularized until the early 2000s with the growth of MOOCs and open courseware online. Today, when we talk about open education, we see openness as a series of freedoms and rights to accessing educational materials, exemplified in David Wiley's five R's. The rights to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute a work. This idea that openness is the freedom to access and use information is clearly a reflection on another, earlier open movement, the open access movement. Open access calls for open and free access to research outputs. It began around the early 90s along with the public availability of the internet through the World Wide Web, though some scholars would argue that they've been trying to freely share scholarship with the public since the invention of writing itself. Open access is often described as having two sides. It can be accomplished by publishing in an open access journal or with an open monograph publisher, or by self-archiving works in an online open access repository. Speaking of publishing, one major shared belief among proponents of the open access and open education movements is the idea that publishers and distributors of content have too strong a hold over scholarly outputs today, whether they're talking about textbooks or scholarly articles. With profit margins rivaling Amazon, publishers like Elsevier, Springer, and Wiley have pushed many scholars into action to share their work freely online, whether that sharing was done legally or not. But most proponents of open access are pushing for legally accessible versions of research outputs to become available, whether they're conference proceedings, posters, slides, or articles and monographs. But negotiating with publishers and trying to build new infrastructure for sharing these works has been difficult, something else that open access has in common with the open education movement. While I've emphasized the ideas that open access and open education share, there is another movement that shares quite a bit with both of these, open science. In fact, proponents of open science often picture it as an umbrella, encapsulating open access, open education, open data, and various activities used in scientific research. As John Tennant, a paleontologist and major advocate for open science has stated, there isn't really one consistent or widely accepted definition of what open science is. For some, he says, open science is about using science to help address the major challenges of society. For others, open science is about democratization of research processes and outputs. What is clear, though, is that what we call open science is really just good science, based on strong social and technical principles like rigor, accountability, transparency, and equality. End quote. Open science is one of the newer and more radical of the open movements, but it also makes a lot of sense. A big problem in modern scientific research is the fear of doing unpublishable research, like replicating previous studies or finding null results. Open science pushes for researchers to make their work open and available for others to study and learn from, even if their results aren't sensational enough to get published in nature. But how does that relate to open education? Well, it's a lot closer than you'd think. A big part of the open education movement is the remixing of resources, building upon what came before and using the five R's to make something new and innovative. All of this can be seen in the open science community as well. Now, I don't have time to get into all the details of these movements, maybe in a later video if you're interested, but I want to make a point here. Each of these open movements has something to offer scholars around the world today. Whether it's access to information, resources, or data, these movements are making a big change and ultimately they're working toward a common goal. Sharing information widely and freely for the benefit of people everywhere. Although open access and open science are still somewhat removed from open education, I hope that as these movements continue to gain traction internationally, we can begin to work together to further that common goal and to improve the lives of scholars, students, and practitioners around the world. Thanks for watching my video. Please comment if you'd like to see more videos about topics like these and feel free to share this video and join in the conversation.